And the sower leads us. And the sower leads us. And the sower leads us. But we definitely need the river of God at work in our lives. And, and this is not what we're talking about this morning, but go in and read Ezekiel 47 and talking about the future kingdom of God and how the river is flowing from the temple and it goes even down into the Dead Sea and, and brings everything to life. And that's just an amazing picture of, of what the power of God can do in moving in his people. So we've been going through the, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, we've been going through those in a, on a yearly cycle. We're coming on to some difficult passages this morning. But it's, it's, it's interesting how things work and how God moves and things. You know, the people of God are still there. This is the, like I said earlier, this is the first day of the new year for them. And actually yesterday was the day that they would have, set up the tabernacle there at the foot of Mount Sinai. So all of them, they haven't really gone anywhere yet. And the presence of God is down. And it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind that now the, the presence and the fire of God has come into their presence because that's really what makes a lot of these passages make sense. Now, how many of y'all have a, a mirror in your house? Most of you did. How many of you checked a mirror this morning? How many of you wish you had checked a mirror this morning? <laughs> wish you had? <laughs> now, here's the thing. Have you, has there ever been a time when, when you knew for certain that somebody did not check themselves in a mirror before they left the house? Have you ever seen that? You've been, there's no way you looked at yourself before you went outside with that. Now, you can tell because a lot of times maybe their hair is all disheveled and messed up. Maybe their clothes are, are a little wrinkled. You know, all, uh, they're wearing you know wrong color outfits or whatever else. You know, wrong socks. All. Not that you see your socks in the mirror very often, but you know. So you probably stood in front of a mirror this morning. Now, have you ever remembered a time when you wish you could have checked yourself again? I missed something. And then you get there and you realize, oh my goodness, I've got a stain right on my shirt or something else like that or something happened in the time when you left the house you know all that stuff happens you know sometimes it's a healthy thing to look into the mirror but you know the mirror that we like to look at doesn't always reflect reality y'all realize that now see i've got a few pictures here i like to show some of these things <clears throat> sometimes we like to be like this yeah, you know, we just look in the mirror to prove that we're looking good today. You know, we're not really looking to check it if anything's wrong. We're just checking to confirm what we already think. Now, sometimes it doesn't always reflect reality either. Because he's like, hey, I look amazing in the mirror. And you're a whole lot, sometimes you're a lot better looking in the mirror than you are in reality. I, I'm, not say, I'm not saying anybody in particular, myself included. But that's, you know, it doesn't always show those types of things. So the mirror we prefer makes us look better than we really are. Okay, this is the whole Snow White storyline. How does that go? Y'all remember that with the, with the evil queen, mirror, mirror on the wall? Who's the See, we know that story. And she's wanting to get this feedback of, aren't I good looking? Aren't I the best at whatever it is? She wanted to see her beauty, but not her evil and not her sin in her life. That's us. That's who we are. See, unfortunately, we need a mirror that better reflects reality. And that's really what the Word of God is for us. It's a mirror which shows us our true condition and our true situation. Scripture defines holiness for us that's what the standard is we are to be holy as we were talking about last week because he is holy he is inviting us to join him in that walk of holiness and when our lives are reflected off of that mirror 
a lot of times we realize and we see just how broken we really are. And that's okay. I mean, we need to be reminded of that because so much of the world is trying to convince us otherwise, that everything is fine, everything's okay, nothing needs to change in who we are. But we realize that we are really broken. We are essentially Humpty Dumpty that cannot be put back together again. We have a distorted view of reality. And a lot of times what we try to do, if we don't like what we see in the mirror, we're more inclined to change the mirror than we are changing us. You know, have, there's some of these things that we see at like the, the fun houses at, the, at the, the carnivals and things. Have you all ever gone into the mirror house? When it can make you look taller or shorter or wider or slimmer, all those types of things. Some of that kind of stuff, it's hard to see that. But that's kind of the outside. We'd rather have a mirror give us something that's not true than something that is true. And we think it's funny when it shows things that are distorted, but we don't recognize the distortion. See, in a lot of ways, we would rather change the mirror and call what the, cha- the, the distorted mirror, we'd rather call that normal. And our culture is increasingly doing that with good and evil, right and wrong. It's redefining what normal is. It's redefining what sin is. We're doing, and this came to me late last night, so you'll have to forgive me on this one. And, I, and this is not even something that I showed. Y'all remember a show from the 60s called Twilight Zone? Okay? Y'all remember that? Anybody watch that show? There was an episode, and it, it just jumped to my head in this, in which a woman, it was called the Eye of the Beholder. A woman was in the hospital. She had a terrible accident, and her face was covered with these bandages the whole show. And, they, and all the doctors and all the nurses kept saying, you know, it's going to be okay. We're going to do our best to try to fix this. Uh, I know it's, it's going to be shocking to you when you see it, but, uh, but you'll be okay. Trust us. And so this w- poor woman is just freaking out the whole episode of what could possibly be wrong with her face. And when they finally took the bandages off, she was beautiful. I mean, she was, uh, uh, there was nothing wrong. And she could, looked in the mirror, she's like, what are you talking about? Nothing is wrong with, with my face. I mean, this is, this is the way it's supposed to look. Then she got to take a look at the, the nurses and the doctors. And they all had a, a different look to their face. Every single person had a face more like that. Y'all remember this episode at all? And, of course, their perspective of what was beauty and what was normal was very different from ours. And in a lot of ways, that's the mirror that that Scripture is trying to put for us. It's trying to show us what is hope. Whereas the culture and the rest of, of society, in a lot of ways, is trying to redefine what is normal to fit what we think it should be rather than what it is. Are you with me so far? You following along? So our culture has redefined normal and sin as righteousness, or redefined sin as normal and righteousness as abnormal. And so last week the scriptures defined what sin is. We looked at 1 John as talking about sin is the breaking of the law or lawlessness. In our country we are struggling with that because We as a people no longer even know what the Word of God says, much less do many people accept it as the standard of relating to right and wrong, holiness and behavior, what's appropriate and and what is not. And without any authority, without any standard, we're just left to figure it out on our own. We are doing everything that is right in our own eyes. And a nation and a people that tries to live that way will struggle will fall apart at the seams and we are seeing the spiritual sickness of our nation because of all of these things we need an independent standard for what is right we need a higher authority because our feelings 
And our own wants and desires are, are never going to paint the, the picture that God wants us to because we will justify ourselves. We will do whatever feels right for us. And that's not always going to end well. The word of God examines our hearts. This is Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is living and effective. It's powerful and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it penetrates as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and thoughts of the heart. And if that's not intimidating enough of what the word of God is supposed to do, it goes on in verse 13 to say, no creature, no one is hidden from him. But all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's the part that makes us uncomfortable. That's the part that, that we don't like to be reminded of. of I mean, you mean all the things that I've tried to hide from everybody else God is going to see and God is going to know. Yeah. Nothing is hidden. Everything is exposed. You know, it's like a, a medical doctor and a, a diagnosing agent. That's what the word of God is supposed to be for. And don't you want, you know, the, a doctor or a diagnosing agent, you know, an MRI, a CAT scan, don't you want them to have a clear picture of what's wrong? Or would you rather have them have a fuzzy picture that doesn't show them much. They need to have a clear picture in order to make a right diagnosis. And that's what's going on with what the Word of God does. The Word of God examines our thoughts, our attitudes, our motives, and it lays bare our actions. It reflects what's going on, not just on the outside, but what's on the inside. And the Word of God is our standard. It's our mirror for reflecting our spiritual condition. And He brings what is unholy this is the part that makes us nervous. He, he, he brings what is unholy to the surface so it can be seen and so it can be dealt with. That's the intent of it all. He's not doing this just because he wants to, to beat us up. He doesn't want to lay these things bare and expose them so he can just chastise us. He says, look, this is, this is your cancer, and I've got to show you what it is so we can deal with it. That's holiness. That's sanctification. That's what the presence of God does in our lives. And we're looking at, uh, we've been going through, and we're in Leviticus chapter 12. I know Gene's been waiting for me to get to some of these parts because he's like, man, what are you going to talk about when you get to there? We're in Leviticus 13, I'm sorry. Uh, he says, but, you know, they, some of these things that you read about here are, are not comfortable. They're not easy reading. They're not light reading. They're not stuff that is on your favorites list. I get that. But you know what? We've got to keep in mind that what 2 Timothy says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16. Where'd it go? Hello. I'm missing something. There we go. It says that all Scripture is inspired by God. Okay? That means that includes the parts that we don't like or the parts that we make us uncomfortable. It's all inspired by God, and it is profitable. It is useful for doing a few things. It says for teaching. It is for rebuking. Some, and the rebuking is correcting right, our behavior, showing us the things that we do wrong. Uh, but it also says for correcting, for training in righteousness. So it doesn't just show us all the wrong things that we do. It shows us the things that we should be doing, the right things. So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We need to be complete. We need to be equipped for what God has us to do. And there are some things that interfere with that. And there are some things that help us in that. So it's, we're correcting and training in righteousness. Telling us what's wrong and what not to do. And it's also telling us what to do. And that goes along with um, that idea of the, the fire. You know, Hebrews 12, 29 calls God a consuming fire. We've been seeing a lot of that the last few days, right? This last week, we've been seeing a consuming fire. But uh, Psalm 66, 10 also says, For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. 
You know, the process of taking something like that, just like an, an ore, a mineral, and making it something useful and working requires fire. Y'all realize that? You can't just start with a rock like that and make a sword out of it. It's got to be put to the test. It's got to be heated up. And what happens when you do that, when you start putting it to the fire and you begin to melt the elements in it, all of the, the dross begins to come up to the surface. All of the things that are the impurities, all of the things that, that the, the metal worker doesn't want to have to work with because it, it weakens the, the metal, it makes it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It, it rises to the surface. And then what does he do with it? Does he just leave it there? No, he's able to clean it off to where you can have uh, a, a surface, a, a metallic surface, when they've got it all boiled out and heated out, that it's a surface that begins to almost glass over. It's a surface that becomes essentially a, a, re, a mirror, a reflective face, where all the pure impurities have been taken out. And you can actually do something with that. Now, he, here in Leviticus, we've got to understand that the, the presence of God this consuming fire, this refining fire is now in the midst of their camp. You've got hundreds of thousands, millions of people around there with the presence of God there. And what's going on here, this is a, this is a chapter on the, the different skin ailments and skin diseases that's going on in the camp. But these are not things and diseases like we think of, we think, you know, it uses the word leprosy, but it's not leprosy like we know it and understand it. These are in many ways a supernatural kind of affliction. And it's because the presence of God is there among them. And it's working just like the fire of the, uh, that is getting out of the impurities. It's bringing the hidden things to the surface. It's a physical manifestation of the spiritual sickness in the camp. Because the reality is, what happens to you when you get closer to the fire? You get a little warmer? Yeah, that's a good thing. It's good to be warm, but when you get st stuck into the fire, it can burn you, right? It can, it can hurt. It's not always the most pleasant thing, but the closer that we get to the fire of God, the more our unholiness is revealed and more of our unholiness comes to the surface. Okay? It's just that same kind of picture. The more that our sin begins to stand out, the closer we get to God, you know, the longer that we have begun to serve him. You know, when we first became a believer, many times there were some issues that were pretty major that everybody could see. You hear people talk about, you know, I've been struggling with alcohol for a long time until I came to Christ and then he he dealt with me on that issue and and I haven't had a drink since. I've been struggling with pornography. I've been struggling with all sorts of things in my life and I came to Christ and those things were dealt with. But does that mean when you get some of the big things out of the way at the very beginning that he's got nothing left to do? I mean, he puts you in the fire and some of those things are burned up instantly. But then he puts you back in because there are some impurities and some things that take longer to get rid of than others. And I'll be the first one to tell you, there are some things that he's still working on getting rid of in my life. And there are some things that I know that he is dealing with. And that's a good thing. I don't want him to stop. Because if he stops, that means I've reached my peak and my, uh, there's nothing more that I can be added or improved on me and I'm not going to get there until he comes. That's that, we're talking about the ideas of being justified, sanctified, and then the future glorified. When we are glorified, all of those impurities are now gone. And so here we are reading this thing. We are in the presence of the king. The camp is in the presence of the king. And we were just singing the last week or so about when you're in the presence of the king, you bow the knee. You submit yourself to him because when the king 
you know, when, when some important dignitary comes around, doesn't everybody kind of straighten up a little bit and act a little different? When the boss shows up and starts walking through, all of a sudden everybody's standing kind of more at attention. They're paying attention more. They're not, they're not laying down on the job. They're not slacking off. The video game that they were playing on their phone or their computer, you know, it gets turned off, right? When the boss shows up, everybody behaves a little different king is there among them and it, you what you read what we'll get to in just a moment when you read this section you'll see that the people were examined they would come and they would be before the priests and sometimes they were isolated uh, because of the skin condition on them but it was always with the hope and the intention that they would be brought back into the fellowship always with the hope of restoration and healing because see the way that we understand some of these diseases and conditions that we that it mentions in there most of those are are not curable by our standards these were ones that were because something else was going on in here you know this is the presence of god was the refining fire he was putting pressure on people and that pressure was being applied to their lives and the real person was sometimes being exposed doesn't pressure do that to people See, Jesus put it like this, what comes from the inside. Mark chapter 7, he says, For from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts. Now, we probably, most of us would never know what the evil thoughts in somebody else is, would we? Until it gets translated into action. These were some of those evil thoughts and evil words and statements and things that they were saying and thinking in their hearts that were bubbling up to the surface. They come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, promiscuity, stinginess even, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from in here. And that's what defiles a person. Now what do we do when life's pressures get to us and, and something unpleasant, a thought, an attitude, a judgment, gossip, or slander comes out? When God's word exposes something in our lives that, you know what, that really shouldn't be there. What do we do? This is what's in this passage. We bring the issue to God and we show it to him. We don't try to hide it. We show it to him. When God's word exposes something, this is Leviticus 13, verse 1. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. When a person has a, a swelling, a scab, a spot on the skin on his body, and remember, these are coming to the surface because the presence of God is there. It's the dross that's coming from the impurities in life. A spot on the skin of his body, and it becomes a disease on the skin of his body. He is to be brought to Aaron the priest, or to the one of his sons, the priest. And after the priest examines him, he must pronounce him unclean. So that's that practice of the culture. They would go to the priest for an evaluation, for an answer. What do I do about this? So when something was in question, they would go to the local priest for the direction from God. That was the standard. That's how they defined what was right and what was wrong. And there are times in our lives when what we are doing, what we are thinking, what we are saying needs to be called out by a standard that's not going to let, let us off the hook. Because if I go by my standard, am I going to let myself off the hook? Yep, I'm going to justify what I do. I'm going to uh, uh, say it's okay, it's no big deal, I'll let it slide. See, we need a standard that will do better because this impurity needs to be dealt with because that kind of behavior can destroy a family, it can destroy a church. When we have those kind of thoughts and attitudes and talk about each other, you name it. See, the, what's interesting is the, when you look at the Hebrew for leprosy, it's built around the word which means evil speech. Evil things that you say, and it's gossip, it's grumbling. Was there a lot of grumbling going on in the camp early on as they left Egypt and complaining? Yep. Even when... Uh, Moses' sister Miriam had challenged Moses and was saying things about him, questioning his Moses motives. She was struck with leprosy. 
for a short time. But outside of the camp, until there was time of repentance, and she, and she was healed and brought back. That's what's going on here. So after the people got better physically from this disease, but you know, think again spiritually that, that repentance and confession, they were then to go back to the priest for confirmation. Because the hope was that the priest would welcome them back into camp. But something to, to notice in all of this is when you read through this, the priest was only an observer. The priest could not do anything to actually help them. The priest could not do it for them. He could not heal them. He could just make the observation of, well, okay, yeah, that's, that's what it is. He couldn't change their situation. And that's what makes the work of Messiah so much better. Because when we come to Jesus, is he able to do something about our sin problem? Yes, he can. He can do something that changes our lives and saves us and restores us to what he has called us to be. This is Luke chapter 5. Again, this is a man who was exiled from the culture, from the society, because he had this disease. And he says, while he was in one of the towns, a man was there who had a serious skin disease all over him. And he saw Jesus. And he fell face down and he begged him. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. It's such a powerful statement. I know you can do something if only you really wanted to. And the question is, does he want to? Yeah. That's the amazing thing about our Savior, about Jesus, is that he really does. He doesn't just want to point his finger and accuse. He wants to change your situation. He wants to heal you from what is wrong so that you can be welcomed back with freedom. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And reaching out his hand, he touched him, which is not something he was supposed to do. He touched him saying, I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately the disease left him. And then he ordered him to tell no one. This is where it gets interesting. Don't go off and make a show of all this, but instead, go and show yourself to the priest, which is just what he, they're told to do in Leviticus. And offer what Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. See, this man, he knows that Jesus can do more than just observe or just make an accusation or make a declaration of clean or unclean. Jesus can actually heal. And Jesus wants to. That's the amazing thing. He wants to heal. And he is healing. And healing really only comes to us when, when this impurity, when this sin bubbles to the surface in our life, when it needs to be dealt with. He's the only one that can really fix it. He's the only one that can really deal with it. By telling you know, this man, he's telling him to go and show himself to the priest. He wants, Jesus wants this man, to, his, his healing to be verified. Because, you know, in his situation, in his condition, everybody knew who he was. And everybody knew to stay away from him. Y'all know people like that? They have a bad reputation that it's like, you know, well, don't even go over to his house. If you see him walking down the street, you go around. You don't want to mess with him. And Jesus is saying, I want, I'm willing to come right next to you, wherever you are, whoever you are, and I can change your life, I can heal you. And then he wants them to go and show himself to the priest so they can verify this change, so they can welcome him back to his home and his family and restore him 
But it's also, it's announcing that Messiah has come. When he goes and shows himself to the priest, and he shows that he's been healed of something that only the Messiah, only Jesus can do, then they're going to say, well, who did that? And he would be able to tell them who. And they would be able to make a declaration of, well, maybe this man really is who he says he is. And see, the important thing to realize is if this man here in Luke 5 was like people in our culture today, so many times people in our culture today say, well, let me get myself cleaned up first, and then I'll come to Jesus. If that man had waited for that moment, would he have ever been made clean? No. See, he knew that the proper order of things is you come to him, and then he cleanses us. You don't wait to be cleansed first on your own efforts, on your own works. You come to him and let him cleanse you. You let him forgive you you let him deal with those issues you know when the pressure is on when the a person and their character is revealed when when well, who we are erupts from the inside out and shows everyone where our heart is we come to him and he begins to change us we seek his forgiveness we seek him to make us clean that's the thing that we need to be dealt with whenever we have when God has revealed something in us that is unclean, that is not holy, we come to him and say, Lord, are you willing to make me clean? And his answer is yes. We must let our lives be examined by the word of God. We must listen for the determination of whether something is right or wrong, clean or unclean. We've got to examine our thoughts, our attitudes, our even our possessions, you know, what we watch on TV, what we listen to in music, and take seriously God's determination whether this is good for you or not. Because if I go by my standards, I'll, I'll accept it and move on and never change anything. Usually when that happens, it doesn't get better, it gets worse. Not doing what is right in my own eyes, but what is right in His. And if you continue reading that passage, you know, it even comes to the point where it's talking about uh, possessions like fabric and clothing, things that you wear that get contaminated, contaminated. And at this point, you know, it says they're going through this process of showing it and examining and all that stuff. After it's been washed, the priest is to re-examine the contamination. If the appearance of the contaminated article has not changed, it is unclean. And even though the contamination has not spread, you must burn up the fabric. See, this dross, this impurity that comes, it does no good if it comes to the surface and you leave it there. It's got to be removed. But the amazing thing about it, you know, with the, the, the forger is the one who can do it. But amazingly, in our circumstances, with the refining fire of God, we have to actually let it. We, the iron, can you imagine the iron having a choice saying, you know what, I really want to keep that dross and that impurity in my life. Does that sound like a reasonable conversation? See, once it's been exposed, the, the, the natural, normal thing to do is to say, well, I don't want that a part of me. That's what we see in the book of Acts, what happens. This is in that passage in chapter 19 when there were the the seven sons of Sceva, these guys that were going around trying to cast out demons, and they came across one. These were not disciples of Jesus. These were not believers in Jesus, but they tried to invoke the name of Jesus just because they thought it was like a magic word or something else like that. And the demon turned around and said, well, you know, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, but who are you? They didn't have the authority. They didn't have the power to do what they were claiming. And they were beaten for it. But here in this moment, after they have done all of that, this unclean spirit turned on them. They recognized Jesus and Paul's authority, but not theirs. This became known to everyone, it says, who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. 
Then fear of all uh, fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. It says that many who had become believers came. Again, the refining fire of God's presence at work. They came confessing and disclosing their practices. And while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone, the dross that had come before, that had been demonstrated and shown to be unclean and not a part of their life. You know, this would be like uh, somebody who gets saved and they have, they have stacks of alcohol in their house. And they come and they take it out and they throw it away. Or they break the bottles. Because they don't want to just give it away to one of their buddies. Because that can destroy their life. They're getting rid of it so it doesn't hurt anybody else. They burned them in front of everybody. And they calculated their value, found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. This was not cheap. Okay, so in this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. See, these people, when they came to Jesus for salvation, when they said, if you are willing, you can make me clean, he said, I am willing. Be made clean, and here's where you start. And when you start with those things, when you get that one done, what's he going to say next? Okay, we've dealt with that issue. Here's what's next. And something more is going to come to the surface. And he's going to say, let's deal with that. That's what this, all of this in Leviticus is talking about. When they came to Jesus, they, they learned that some things were no longer compatible with their new identity in Christ, and they were willing to rid themselves of it. That's what we've got to do. We've got to take seriously those things as well in that the Word of God reveals in us. We can't just let it lie. We can't just let it sit there. We must go to our Jesus. We must go to our Messiah for true healing and let Him clean us up. Let Him change our lives. And the great thing is, is He is willing. As we draw closer to Him, We've got to realize that more and more of our sin will be exposed because he wants to deal with it and remove these impurities and make us holy to sanctify us. And this process begins at salvation, but it continues after salvation. He wants to restore us to the fellowship. And there was a song that was real popular back in the 90s, I guess it was. It might have been older than that, called Refiner's Fire. Anybody remember hearing that one? You remember that one? It goes off. It says, purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and pure gold. It, and it goes on. It says, cleanse me from within and make me holy. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from my sin that's deep within. Is my one, my refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy. Set apart for you, Lord. He says, I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my master. Ready to do your will. That's the process that he wants to bring us to. He wants us to examine our lives, to bring things to him. And when he shows us what they are, to deal with them and to rid ourselves of them. And that's, for each one of us, because he's never going to stop doing that in our lives. And that's a good thing. Because we want to be pure and holy before him. Ready to do his will. Ready to be used for his purpose and his kingdom. Because as long as those impurities are in our life, there are some things that we're not going to be ready for. We're not going to be equipped for. There are going to be some things that that will interfere with us able to accomplish what God wants us to do. So think about that in the sense of what is God showing you? What is he revealing in you? What is he bringing to the surface that he wants to heal you from, to deal you with you on? So that you may be effective and powerful in his hand. 